Heritage Open Day 2021 presents Becast. There. Welcome to Becast from the Heritage Open Days for Chelmsford. My name is Michelle Durant and over the next half an hour or so we're going to explore the world of bees and beekeeping. So let's get down to business. Did you see what I did there? Uh-huh. Uh, I'm going to introduce you to James Curtis who is a beekeeper at Wild Wing Honey. Tell me about beekeeping. What got you into it? Um, I always say, and I've said this quite a few times to lots of people, that my grandfather was very interested in landscape. He used to grow um, prized chrysanthemums and entered a lot of shows for his vegetables and things like that. So I think the interest in in the natural world and landscape and and pollination in general kind of stemmed from that, that sort of romantic period of my childhood. Um, being with him in his garden and pottering around and then that interest just grew into doing my own gardening and then that eventually grew when I moved out to Chelmsford from London having the opportunity to be able to keep honeybees in the back garden and it's just evolved from there. Is there a lot of investment needed to get started as a beekeeper? Um, Yeah I mean it's there's a lot of financial investment initially there's also a lot of time investment as well Um, and those two things go go hand in hand really so you can start with a a, a colony of honeybees probably two um, we always recommend two um, from sort of 400 pounds each I would say would get you going Um, but once you've invested in that and and the equity is there they last for a long long time providing they're looked after and you looked after your bees as well Uh, they will they will last you last your lifetime really how much support is there out, out there for new beekeepers? Uh, there's, a, there's a huge amount. Our local division, which is the Chancel of Beekeepers, um, we've got about 150 members in, in, in the division itself, um, and that sits under the umbrella of the British Beekeepers Association, which is probably what everyone will be familiar with. Um, a registered charity, obviously, um, and they're there to support new beekeepers. We do um, training, as part of that so we'll train um, people who are interested in the craft of beekeeping to become new beekeepers uh, there's a theory and a practical course that runs every year to train new intakes um, and that's that's growing year on year and and therefore after that after you you become a beekeeper you can um, you can go to the monthly meetings that obviously at the moment are held online but um, used to be in, in person some great speakers Um, that come and present and talk all different things not just honeybees but bumblebees and pollination and all manner of different things but also whilst you're there you can ask beekeepers have been keeping bees 40 years you know any questions that you may have or 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 queries and they'll they'll answer them so there's there's a huge amount of support network behind the training as well how many people are in the chelmsford beekeepers at the moment there's approximately 150 members in total and there's a there's also a board that sits behind that as well which has a a chair and a vice chair that orchestrate all the educational components of uh, what chelmsford beekeepers do that that's quite surprising 150 people Uh, i didn't realize there would be so many people interested in beekeeping yeah it's huge and and they're just they're just general beekeepers so they'll be they'll all have their own colonies so when you think each beekeeper maybe has on average four or five colonies you think how many colonies are spread across Chelmsford and a little bit further we tend to get members from from other other areas around Chelmsford um yeah huge amount of bees huge amount of beekeepers So James, let's talk a little bit about the Chelmsford Beekeepers. What's the background to the organisation? 
So it was established in uh, in December in 1918, um, and widely grew since then. It's obviously post-war, um, and it established and, and and grew in number to where we see it today. So you said the, the membership was 150 now. Mm. Is is there an age range? Um, is it like uh, young people and and older older people or? Um, uh, there is a wide mixture. Um, I think because of the time commitment involved in keeping bees, uh, it's not something we tend to find younger members necessarily do. Uh, there's always a massive interest, obviously, from from the younger generations. Um, but because there's a lot of time commitment, a lot of financial costs in, in terms of keeping bees. Um, we tend to find that it's people kind of the age, above the age of 40 or 50 mm. that tend to keep those colonies um, and yeah keep them for the rest of their lives essentially how, how long is the lifespan of a bee? Uh, in the summer can be six weeks um, to generally two or three months um, but then in the winter they, can, they have to go six months we're into a climate emergency mm. Bees are endangered. Why, why are they endangered? Well, actually, honeybees aren't endangered. Um, it's, a slight, it's a slight misconception, I mm. think, in the public. Um, because they're a managed, essentially, livestock, they're classed as a livestock in this country, um, they, they, uh, the numbers are actually increasing in terms of honeybee numbers. And there's a lot of research published behind that that say they may be partly responsible for the decline in our natural solitary bee and bumblebee populations because they outcompete. Um, they're, they're very, very good at doing what they do, which is pollinating and, and gathering nectar. Um, so it's actually our solitary bees, our native solitary bees, which is one of my favourite is the hairy-footed flower bee, for example, um, and our bumblebees, like the buff tails, um, that are, are, are in problem. You know, they are having a hard time because of... Uh, a lack of diversification in in our in our agricultural system potentially loss of hedgerow um, loss of nature lots of kind of wilding and and habitats that they would be used to are all being being removed really what can people do to help our bees um, there's lots of things you can do um, you can obviously do what everyone says which is is plant forage for them that uh, suitable for the whole year round um, try and plant as many native species of flowering plant as you possibly can um, but I also think there's not enough emphasis put on trees trees are a potential huge huge source of uh, both nectar and pollen to, to all bees not just honeybees um, and they're actually often overlooked in, in favour of you know more flowery varieties of of low growing plants and shrubs um, but trees are especially important not just for bees but all other parts of the ecosystem as well um, but I would I would always suggest that you try and plant if you can um, plants that cover the whole variation in, in season so that spring potentially through to winter with things like ivy which is a great crop late crop for all sorts of, uh, of pollinating insects is it true that a bee, once it stings someone, that's it for the bee? In terms of honeybees, uh, yes, because they have a barbed stinger. So because of our, our skin of being a mammal is quite thick, unfortunately when the stinger goes in, more often than not, the stinger can't be removed when the bee moves. So it does detach, unfortunately, and that, that bee can die. But there is, if, and as a beekeeper I've done it a few times, you do get stung um, and you're quick enough you can actually remove the stinger as the bee moves away and the stinger actually removes as part of that process but they only die because the stinger gets gets stuck in the skin basically. I've seen things online about rescuing bees with um, like sugared water is that right? Yeah and that can be done yeah um, we always say not to give honey very important not to give honey yeah um, because you don't know the source of where that honey's come from it may contain pathogens viruses or disease that could pass on to that bee and then they could then infect other members of their colony so if you if you really want to help it um, you can you can try a sugar solution but generally most of the time if it's a warm day um, you've not had any rain or major thing and you find a bee 
whether it's a bumble or a honeybee on the floor, it's generally because they're at the point of of death really right. um, and there's probably not much at that point you can do for, for them mm. um, they've either worked themselves to the point where they can't fly anymore um, or they're, they're suffering from something else but by all means try <laughs> just don't try honey yeah <laughs> so um, you, you make honey don't you well my bees make honey You're, yeah, I'm, yeah I'm not very good at honey making but yeah my bees yeah, and, and you sell it, it locally yes I do yes tell, tell me a little bit about honey production um, how long does it take to go from the hive to the shelf uh, very very quickly um, I over the years every beekeeper finds their own way of keeping bees um, there's obviously the, the British Beekeepers Association way of doing things and that's how we train all new beekeepers to do it um, but over the years people people find different ways of doing it so um, I have a process that I've I've kind of slowly refined I guess you would say that a pun in pun in the name there um, where honey extraction I've tried to keep it as possibly as simple as I possibly can um, so how that works is uh, over over the course of the year um, or over the course of the season so from spring to sort of late summer where nectar's coming into the colony that gets stored in what we call a honey super which is a, a kind of wooden box most of the time at the top of the hive it's full of honeycomb so the bees put all their nectar in there they reduce the water content to about 20 percent or, or lower um, they then put a wax cap over the top of that honey and it's stored for hundreds of years potentially it's, it's become slightly inert at that point um, so we come along as beekeepers we take those supers off obviously when they're free of bees and we have ways and means of doing that that doesn't cause any damage or harm to the bees themselves um, and that gets that gets taken off and put into um, most of the time a centrifugal extractor. So it's a big washing machine, if you can imagine, on its on its side, so pointing upwards. And we put all our frames in once we've taken the wax capping off. And you can either do that with a knife or um, with a hot air gun. Um, and we put those in, and we just spin the honey, and the honey all flings off and, and trickles down to the bottom of the of the the extractor where we put it into into food grade buckets. And that can be stored then for years and years and years and years and years until we decide that we want to put it into jars. Um, so my method then is just to gently warm that honey up to about 30 degrees, which is the temperature the bees keep it at in the, in the colony, um, enough for it to be pourable. Um, and then it just goes into jars, the lid goes on, it's labelled and that's it. Wow. And this, what happens to the wax? Is, is that another product that you can sell? You can, and a lot of beekeepers do it. They make it into candles and it's in everything probably cosmetic you can possibly imagine it obviously goes into furniture polish and shoe polish um, but generally beekeepers make it into candles or or other small little products that they'll sell along alongside their honey um, the the wax generally comes from when you're uncapping the, the honey and there's a wax cap on the top um, which comes off and that, that just gets melted down and refined so it gets put through a sieve all the kind of major bits of, of stuff that you don't want in it are taken out um and it gets formed into whatever they want it to be formed into so i mean you, you, you you've dealt with the wax you've taken the honey from the comb mm. is there any wastage with beekeeping no i think that's what's what's really good about it from an environmental point of view is it's it's i always say it's like a circular pattern um so all really all that gets wasted in reality is any wax cappings if you want to get rid of those and you don't want to make them into candles that's the only thing that would actually be the waste product nothing else is wasted all the frames that hold the wax in there are all made of wood so you know that's a really environmentally sustainable source all the hives generally are made of wood um yeah there's very little wastage that's quite impressive mm. yeah. Listening to the Bee Cast. It's for Chelmsford Heritage Open Days 2021. My name is Michelle, and we've been talking to James Curtis, a beekeeper. We've been learning a little about the historic Chelmsford beekeepers, and of course, a bit about beekeeping in general. But right now, 
We put on the bee suits and we go and open the hive. First of all, James gets out his smoker. Okay, so I'm just lighting my hive smoker. So this generally is used, um, it doesn't, a lot of people think it puts bees to sleep um, or makes them lazy or, or slow. What it does, it makes them think that they're they're trees on fire, they're, they're tree dwelling insects. Um, the fact we keep them in a, in a box, they don't really know the difference. Um, so this just makes them think that they're trees on fire. So what they do is they go and be busy elsewhere. They go and get, they raid all their honey stores. And um, the reason they do that is because they think they're going to need to leave to go and find another home because their tree will no longer be there. So they just go and open up all their honey. They get as much honey as they can and they fill their, their honey stomachs with it in order to um, to fly to there and set up a new colony somewhere else so it just distracts them for a while um, I don't tend to use it a huge amount um, because I again he keeps developing their own way of doing it but the BB BBKA suggests that we should always use them um, it's more as a safety measure I think for me um, just in case I need to use it at any point either if, if something doesn't go quite to plan um, or I need to do certain manipulations on them, I'll always use use the, the smoker. So I always light it, I always make sure it's lit, I've always made sure I've got it with me, um, just in case I ever need it. This works really well, pine cones. Pine cones. Nice and awesome dry, and keep going. Sorry, I'm smoking out a bit there. <laughs> you smell like a bonfire, like I do. <laughs> Um, if you stand in the front, you'll get covered in bees. Because right. they'll all be I'm flying actually today, but they'll all be coming back from out um, collecting and they'll all land on you because you're nice and warm. Okay, so if you're not happy at any point, feel free to okay. <laughs> go and stand. You'll be surprised how many bees are in here. If you get stung, mm. tell me straight away. Okay. So, the top is one of the honey supers I'm talking about. This is where all the honey gets stored. Have a quick look in and see. There's nothing in that one. There's plenty at the moment. There's a bit, there's a bit in there you can just see. I'll uncap that, there's probably some under there. No, it's all empty at the moment. There, look. All right, yeah. yeah. So that is raw natural honey. That's honey, honey yeah. Nothing done to it. Oh. It's all the bees' handiwork. This was extracted last week, so they've not started to fill it back up yet. How long does it take them to do to fill up? Uh, it depends. Depends what the weather's doing. Uh, we've had a lot of rain, obviously recently, which is good because with a lot of rain. Be the um, plants tend to produce a lot of nectar, um, but now we need a bit of sunshine to, uh, to get the bees out flying and they can go and gather it. There's lots of statistics in terms of how many, how many miles a bee needs to fly in order to make a teaspoon of honey. Mm. Um, it's, a, it's a phenomenal amount, I can't remember off the top of my head. But. Well, you can really hear them now. Yeah. All the queens not on that one. Is it one queen per hive? One queen per hive, yeah, that's it. How can you tell the difference between the she, queen and the others? She looks very different. So in a colony there'll be workers, which are all female, and drones, which are all male, and the queen, which is female. That's the constituent makeup of each each hive. Um, and they all look slightly different. So workers, you can see the majority of them on the top here. Not great for radio, obviously, but they, they tend to be smaller. Um, drones are, are, are a lot bigger and they have larger eyes because um, they have to fly very fast to try and catch the queen to mate with her. 
um, and they're obviously a bit more muscular because they have to fly a lot quicker as well um, and the queen has a lot is a lot longer than all of all those other two there's a lot longer abdomen for storing all the eggs in that she'll lay mm. throughout the course of her life so she'll live for anywhere between two to five years um, and she mm. lays at the height of the year probably two to three thousand eggs a day um, and she'll do that you know until she can't lay any more she runs out of eggs and then they replace her wow that's a lot of bees how many bees am i looking at do you think there's probably 20 30,000 in this particular hive goodness um but it can go up to some of my bigger colonies 50 60,000 um at the height of the height of the season that'll drop down in winter to a thousand maybe in each in each hive so wow. there's a huge increase and decrease in numbers over the season yeah um, as the requirements of the hive changes. Yes. Um, so obviously in the summer you need lots of bees in order to gather lots of honey, yeah. lots of pollen, to make the hive really successful. In the winter those those requirements are no longer needed, so all the honey that they store they'll use up, um, and they don't need to feed the workforce because the workforce is, is basically is, isn't, isn't there anymore. These are all workers at the moment. Yeah. They're all female. Not the sign of the queen yet. Mm. Can't believe how many I'm oh, seeing. No, it's, it's like a lot. It's not thousands. a huge amount, it's, it's, it's a good number. Yeah. And each hive will have its own temperament as well. So, this one, the reason I've chosen this one is because they're, they're normally quite calm. Mm. The far, the far colony at the end, you only need to lift the lid and they'll just jump straight on you. Yeah. Very different temperament. And what's that tool called that you're using to prise out the honeycomb? This is called a uh, hive tool or a J hive tool. So yeah. it's it formed a bit of shape of a J. It's, it's steel. Um, it has a multitude of uses really. I mean, the majority of use I use it for, as you can see, is yeah. that I'm prizing frames apart where they stick them all together with propolis, ah. which is another product that they make, um, which is all the brown sort of sticky stuff, and they stick everything together with it to make our job really hard of going through, <laughs> as mm -hmm. you can tell. Um, but it has all sorts of uses from uncapping honey, mm -hmm. uncapping the top of broods to see if we've got any, mm. um, varroa in the bottom, which is a parasitic mite. Um, you can hammer nails in with it, which I've done before. You can take nails out with it. You can <laughs> cut things. You can, it, yeah, anything, you name it. It's a, it's a multifunctional piece of equipment. Yeah. Um, but you often lose them in the grass, which is why they're painted bright red <laughs> or bright yellow. Yeah, that's a good idea. Um, so you can see all of this here mm. is all um, new bees. And there's a few bees just being born here. Look, if you can see them there. Let's see if I can look carefully you see them sticking their little oh, yeah. antenna out so they're nibbling around the top of the their cell and they're chewing off the cap that keeps them in yeah and has helped them be um, sterile inside their cell while they're while they're pupating yeah they're now chewing that all away and they'll slowly but surely come out wow and we'll to see one being born if i just give it a little hand of freeing the comb around it. it might come out for us. Here she comes. Aww. So this will be a worker coming out now. There she is. So she, she's a little bit lighter mm. in colour, so they get slightly darker as they get a bit older. I see. So she'll wander off now, have a bit of a mope around, probably be fed by a few of her sisters, and be set straight to work, probably tidying up and cleaning up the colony, cleaning up the inside of the hive. And she might go and do a bit of guard duty at the front door, hey. and then she'll eventually go out and start collecting some pollen, some nectar, some water, um, and, and contributing to the success of the colony. Wow. So the, um, I'm seeing little white things inside mm -hmm. and are they the pupae yeah so there's larvae there's lots of different stages of things at the moment so obviously the queen queen lays an egg 
um, and it starts to pupate, it turns into a lava, um, and then um, eventually turns into a, into a new bee. So there's lots of honey and pollen in there. You can see some yellow in the bottom of that cell. Yeah. That's some pollen there, different colours. There's a bright yellow, some more orangey yellow. There's a white pollen there. So again, that's all coming in from the plants that are in flower at the moment. Yeah. And that pollen will be fed directly to all the, the, the eggs that are being laid um, and used in all sorts of things inside the colony as well as the honey itself. Wow. We haven't seen the queen yet, have I mean, we? Uh, haven't been looking really, but um see if I can find her quickly. Maybe she's on a road trip. Yeah, she might be. She always runs away from you. <laughs> she likes to hide in the dark spots, so she'll always be moving quickly. Yeah. I presume you've not looked in a bee colony before. No, no, it's time. fascinating. It's all the bees just getting on with their yeah, business, I guess. Busy doing their jobs. Yeah, without <laughs> trying to throw in too many bee puns. Yes. <laughs> what do people say to you when when you tell them that you do beekeeping? Um, I think they're always a bit surprised, but generally people tend to know a beekeeper already that's the funny thing they'll always say oh my my grandfather was a beekeeper or my uncle kept bees or yeah. and it is amazing how many people you speak to and you say you're a beekeeper and they say oh i know a beekeeper yeah um, there's always a connection there somewhere but yes. they're obviously always really really interested <laughs> and they always they've always got lots and lots of questions um, and i think you know the questions come in all different shapes and sizes and forms and there's always unique ones and different ones but yeah i think people are just generally fascinated that yeah it's such a in a way it's such an eccentric and bizarre thing to do yeah um but of course it's done worldwide in all different sorts of shapes and sizes so yeah there's always interesting questions wow and she's being elusive from us today <laughs> Is she? Oh no, I thought it was her name. Not. <laughs> Could be anywhere. Could be anywhere. Looking through thousands of, of frames for one bee. Yeah, one bee. <laughs> Normally hiding under lots of other bees or hiding in a gap somewhere. Yeah. We might be chasing her, so she tends to run away as well. So she'll, she'll move. She's probably moving up to the end frames here. Yeah. Trying to keep out of the light because she knows that she doesn't want to be in the light because she's at risk of being eaten potentially by anything that's coming in to find her. So uh, they're predators for bees? Yeah, we don't have a huge amount in this country. Woodpeckers mm. have done a fantastic job this year of making uh, some of my hives full of holes, oh. which I've not had before. Um, but now, obviously, being out a bit more in the countryside, they've taken a definite liking to, uh, to my hive. So... It's not a huge amount, really. They can get knocked over if you keep them in a field by horses and goats who are having a, you know, a scratch on something. Mm. Um, we don't have a huge amount of predators. I mean, the biggest risk, potentially, that we're going to have that is potentially in this country is the Asian hornet. Yeah. Um, which has been in the news. And that's not, that's not our native European hornet. We have a native European hornet that's really quite placid. They're massive, massive insects. Um... But they, they make a heck of a noise. They sound like a small helicopter going past. Um, but they, they don't really predate too much on honeybees. They'll, take, they'll, t they'll pick a, the odd one off from the front of the colony. Mm. But the Asian hornet is a real risk, really, to, to beekeepers in this country and, and bees in this country because they will decimate colonies. Um, they have them in France, and I think there's some cases of it in Jersey. Yeah. Um, and how do you deal with a, a predator like the Asian hornet? There's lots of... Um, techniques that have been developed especially by French beekeepers who've had to deal with this problem um, who also uh, keep Apis mellifera which is, is, is the, uh, the honeybee we're looking at now mm. um, there's traps and all sorts of things you can put in underneath the hive to fool, fool the Asian hornet mm. to stop them coming in um, there's also some evidence that 
our honeybees or the French honeybees have started to develop a technique where they actually make a sort of a hissing noise yeah um and this is a a new phenomenon that's been discovered since the asian hornet's been there Mm. um to kind of um ward off the hornets from coming in but um i'm not sure how successful they've been yet at deterring that i know they have a huge problem over there with them and i think it's really sadly only a matter of time until we get it over here as well in, in a larger scale um, so there's lots of measures in place um, with the National Bee Unit and with DEFRA that are monitoring the situation and making sure we've got adequate um, warnings and safeguards in place around the country with, with, with hives that are strategically positioned around ports to make sure that as soon as that, the Asian hornets come in that, that, that they deal with them quickly and they, they've been doing a phenomenally fantastic job yeah. of finding the nests that have been over here and we've had a few. Mm. and they've, they've, they've removed them so hopefully at the moment we're fairly yeah. Euro- um, Asian Hornet free yeah wow and there you go there you go didn't see her well, I don't know what she was up to but <laughs> I did go for I didn't want to disturb them anymore so I know it's a bit cooler today yeah excellent Yeah, that's quite a calm hive. But if you go down, that one's a really Busy grumpy run. one. Yeah. Grumpy hive. Grumpy. You, you've, they've got characters. They, they're all definitely different. Yeah. Yeah. Very, very different. Some can be nice as nice as anything, and others can be yeah a little bit grumpy with you. Oh. Um, but it's generally sometimes the grumpy ones are the most productive. Yeah. They produce the most honey. So. <laughs> Excellent. Absolutely fascinating to see the hive being opened by James. And as we draw the bee cast to a close, let's just find out a little bit about the honey sold by Wildwing. James, your product that you sell, where can people get hold of it? We sell a we sell a large amount online through our online store. Um, we also sell it sell it at the door as well. Um, so you can either order um, through our, our website, our World Week Honey website, which you can find online. Um, and you can either, we've been running contactless collection since the start of lockdown. So we leave the honey out for people to come and collect it. Um, but we're also welcoming people back to the door now to, to come and have a chat. Because when people buy honey, they always want to talk about bees and are generally interested in what we do. Um, and I, I think that's a, a critical part of being a beekeeper is to, is to educate people yeah. um, in beekeeping and, and what we do. So it's nice to be able to have those conversations again. So, yeah. And you, you do bee experiences. We do, yeah. And it's been really popular this year. I think off the back of lockdown, everyone wants to go out into, into the countryside and see some, some of the natural environment, which is great. So, yeah, we have some bee experiences, which is a half-day event. And we talk about beekeeping and I rattle on for two hours about equipment and how we manipulate the hives um, we do some honey tasting um, and we I make a lovely honey cake and we have tea and coffee and then we have a little visit to the colonies as well so we all get dressed up and look silly in our bee suits and, uh, and go and have a look a little look round. From where you get people coming for your bee experiences how many actually take it up as a hobby afterwards? A lot of people tend to then I think it's more of an inquisitive thing yeah I think people tend to do it just because they're interested um it's obviously in no way a form of training or anything else like that um so I would always obviously encourage people who who do want to take it up after that and I always do mention to people who do show an interest in taking it further it's obviously to to contact their local um beekeeping division yeah and take it up with them yeah so uh, let's let's talk about um, Chelmsford beekeepers again, who they also have experiences as well, don't they? Yeah, they do taster days, um, yeah. and that uh, happens in the summer. They do quite a few of those, and they've again managed to start running those this year. Um, and they are uh, a few hours again up, up at looking through a colony, um, and then they also have obviously the theory and practical courses that run every year that that train the new cohort of beekeepers coming through. Fantastic. And what's the website for the Chelmsford Beekeepers? It's chelmsfordbeekeepers.com. 
James, it's been lovely spending time with you and looking at your bees. Thank you very much. Thank you. And that has been the Beecast. Thank you very much for listening. I do hope that you found it as interesting as I did. Please do go and check out the other events on offer on the Heritage Open Day website. Also feel free to check out Chelmsford Community Radio, your truly local community radio station for Chelmsford, either via our brand new app available from your friendly neighbourhood app store or the website and you can find details of our full programme schedule and the volunteers that present the shows. Finally, a big thank you to the Chelmsford Beekeepers for supporting our project and, of course, James Curtis. You can check out his website, wildwinghoney.co.uk. Thank you very much. Goodbye. Beecast.